Good evening, this is Eye on Africa on France 24. The headlines tonight on the continent. Blaise Campore returns to Burkina Faso after an eight-year exile. The controversial former president invited back to take part in an extraordinary summit with five other former leaders as the country battles an Islamist insurgency. Fears grow of one-man rule in Tunisia as the draft constitution reveals plans for the president to tighten his grip on power further. We get reaction from legal experts. And we mark the first ever World Swahili Day with a visit to Tanzania to hear why many people are so proud of the widely spoken language. We start this programme in Burkina Faso, though, where the former president, Blaise Campaore, returned today for the first time since being ousted in a popular uprising eight years ago. He's been invited back to join an extraordinary summit of five ex-presidents to discuss the political and security turmoil in the country. But his return is a controversial one. In April, he was sentenced to life in jail in absentia for his role in the killing of the revolutionary leader, Thomas Sankara. France 24's Sophie Lamotte reports. Crowds gathered outside Ouagadougou's main airport in support of the visit of Blaise Compare. He left Burkina Faso in 2014 and has not returned since. He's a controversial figure who was sentenced to life in prison earlier this year for his role in the murder of Thomas Sankara, considered the father of the Burkina Bay revolution. Sankara's lawyers are calling for justice to be done and for Compare to be detained. Si Blaise Compaoré vient au Burkina Faso et il repart allègrement, ça veut dire que dans notre pays, il n'y a plus ni la justice ni la loi. Ça veut dire que c'est une dictature, une forfaiture qui va s'imposer à notre peuple. Another awkward encounter might be with former President Kabore, who put out an international warrant for the arrest of Compaoré before being ousted from power by a military coup led by General Damiba in January this year. The same military leader who is now hosting talks in a bid to defuse the political situation. Five former Burkina Bay presidents are invited to join the MIBA, hoping to put their differences aside for the greater good of the nation. The rencontre importante entre les différents chefs d'État est la question donc de la réconciliation, mais aussi de mutualiser les énergies et les synergies pour sauvegarder ce qu'il y a de plus précieux à nos yeux, c'est-à-dire euh, l'existence toujours de notre terre, le Burkina Faso. These talks signal a show of unity against a terrorist threat in a context where more than 2,000 people have been killed in Burkina Faso since 2015 and more than 2 million people have been displaced due to violence caused by insurgent Islamic groups. To Sudan now, where pro-democracy groups took steps today to unify, announcing a revolutionary council in opposition to military general Abdel Fattah al-Buhan. It will include union leaders, activists and relatives of those killed in the democracy protests. The announcement today comes just three days after Buhan announced he was willing to step aside for a civilian government, but democracy leaders say his words cannot be trusted. With more on that new council, here's Manal Siam, one of its co-founders. The council will bring together revolutionary forces under a unified leadership to call for sit-ins, civil disobedience and strikes. It will direct political action via a charter drafted from the suggestions of the committees and other revolutionaries. Next, let's head to Tunisia, where there are questions about whether or not the country is heading for one-man rule. It is certainly a fear by some in the opposition and by political activists. A week after the government published the new draft constitution that would give the president sweeping powers. Now, they include the ability to dissolve parliament and to remain in office beyond the current two-term limit on grounds of an imminent danger to the state. Well, our team in Tunis have spoken to legal experts about the text and what it may mean for Tunisia. At the Tunis University Law Faculty, where Tunisia's president was a lecturer just a few years ago, most of his former colleagues are concerned about his new constitution. 
The Constitutional Law Association meticulously combed through the new text proposed by Kai Syed. There's no way to impeach the president. The powers of the Constitutional Court have been reduced. It's common sense to have power check power. If there's no balance of power, there will be overreaches or arbitrariness. Many opposition figures say the exercise is illegitimate. Rather than voting no, many key political voices are calling for a boycott of the July 25th referendum. We are campaigning against the referendum. We're calling on people to boycott it because we consider this constitution as nothing but a new step in the coup d'etat process, which is trying to install an authoritarian regime. However, Kai Saya does have his vocal supporters. The popular current is an Arab nationalist party that's campaigning for a yes vote. Despite the criticism of this new constitutional text and the absence of certain articles, we think it can open new horizons. It could put in place a clear authority figure, which is something which was absent in the previous constitution. The vote will be held after only three weeks of campaigning amidst a volatile political context. The president can't give hope to Tunisians who've seriously lost confidence in politics over the last 10 years, and he can't make them optimistic. The constitution could pass regardless of the referendum results. Article 139 of the new draft says that it will enter into force on July 25th, and there is no mention of what happens if turnout is low or if the no vote wins. Now, there have been fresh clashes today between M23 rebels and soldiers in eastern DR Congo, forcing residents to flee their homes. The rebels and the Congolese army have both blamed each other for the outbreak of fighting today. It comes just a day after the presidents of DR Congo and neighbouring Rwanda agreed to de-escalate diplomatic tensions over the insurgency there. This M23 offensive began at the end of March, and the Congolese government has accused Rwanda of backing the insurgency. It is an allegation it has consistently denied. Now, the agriculture industry is a vital one to Kenya's economy, employing about 40% of the working population. But the country is currently in the grip of a drought, and the sector has been forced to adapt to the realities of, this, of, of climate change. For this report, our team in Kenya look at how digitization is helping farmers there and how it may even combat regional food insecurity. Perpetual Muni is not a farmer like the others. Phone in hand, she prepares the next harvest with the help of the AgriBot application. 0139, the Ohio AgriBot. Mm -hmm. So from there, you have an option, what you want from the agri-boat. After two years without a rainy season, she had to find alternative crops that can withstand the drought with free information provided by the application. This time we have all the information, the best things to use, the spacing, yeah, the preparation, everything. Yes, okay. it really has it. And from that you get high yield. The Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa and Microsoft created the app in 2019. Still in the pilot phase, it is already used by 50,000 smallholder farmers. To go further, Embu County is launching a new public-private partnership to ensure food security and practice more sustainable agriculture. Where possible, where you can get um, institutions, whether big or small, that are able to partner with development partners and government, that is what we promote as an institution because we know that now none of us can independently drive a transformation in agriculture. So partnership is really the way to go. A profound transformation also promoted by the United Nations, while the Horn of Africa has suffered for several months the worst drought in 40 years. Digital agriculture is going to continue playing a, a key role in the region. And it's very clear that in time of drought, the more we get information on the forecast, accurate forecast, and the more we can make sure that the information is reaching farmers, then the better the farmers can adapt to the context. Ultimately, the AgriBot application is intended to be used by the entire African continent. According to World Bank projections, Agriculture could represent a sector of nearly a trillion dollars by 2030. 
Finally, today is the world's first ever Swahili Day. Now, events were organised by the United Nations to celebrate what is now one of te the ten most spoken languages on the planet. Our team in Tanzania has been to find out why so many there are proud of the language. A celebration of Swahili through dance. It's the world's seventh most spoken language and a central part of Africa's heritage, but also a source of modern pride. We're different from other nations. Other Africans adopted colonial languages. For example, those who were colonized by the British, they speak English. And those colonized by the Portuguese, they speak Portuguese even though they are Africans. For us, this is heroic and this is a big step forward. All that remains is to figure out how to make our language internationally accepted. Education activists in Tanzania criticize the teaching of foreign languages in many schools and universities as they believe it undermines the uptake of Swahili. Teachers and students want it to become the official language of instruction in schools to protect its future, but also the future of the speakers themselves. Pupils in preschools learn in Swahili, but when they reach secondary school, suddenly they have to study in English. That switch causes people to get low marks. They even felt at some subjects, become discouraged and drop out. Often sharing the limelight with colonial languages, Swahili is set to go from strength to strength. It's spoken across the east coast of Africa, including Kenya, Tanzania and Uganda, and is an official language of the African Union. Earlier this week, the Ugandan government moved to make it an official language to make trade and communication easier within the region. And that's it for Iron Africa this evening. Thanks for watching.